it's good to be here. Uh, loving warm evening. It seems to be the thing now, isn't it? Warm evenings uh, are never in good sound. I hope you're all comfortable. And uh, if you're not, just think of me here with my glass of water. <laughs> Uh, let's let's begin uh, with our first song. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Uh, I'm going to come down. <laughs> Said to her, you know, if she was the only person alive on, on, on the planet, then the Savior would still have come for her. And that's so important. But then she heard another sermon that said, if she was the only person alive on the planet, then it still would have been necessary for a Savior to come. Because her sin is so significant, her sin is so serious, it would have taken the creator of the universe to come down. Incarnate in, in, in Jesus' Son to die for her, so loved so much and yet forgiven so much. And that's the, that's, the, that's, that's the balance we contend with in a holy God who has to do with our sin and a loving God who shows mercy to us. Let's have a word of prayer and then perhaps after we've done notices, if there are any, so let's, let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we come to your house uh, this afternoon. Um, we thank you that we can enjoy fellowship with one another. We thank you that we can encourage one another and we, we're encouraged by your word. Let your Holy Spirit open up your word for us and he applies it to our lives. 
we search the scriptures, we examine the scriptures, but all the time the scriptures are examining us and penetrating our very hearts. So we submit to your word, we submit to you as Lord, we want to hear your voice, and only your voice. We want to see Christ, as we sung, uh, as we sung earlier, we want to see Christ, and we want to go away as changed people, more useful for our Master. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So the reading is from St. John's Gospel. It's chapter 1, verses 19 to 28, and you'll find it on page 1063. And the, the description that uh, precedes the reading is John the Baptist denies being Christ. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Christ. They asked him, who then are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent, questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me the thongs of whose sands I am not worthy to untie. All this happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of God. Let's just pray once more as we are good to God. Father God, we ask that you would just open our eyes and our minds and bless your word to us. And it's good to remember that this is the end of God. So help us to concentrate, help us to take it in, break it down for us, and challenge us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. John chapter 1, a very well-known portion, and uh, the first section is called the Prologue, verses 1 to 18. And John's Gospel, if you're familiar with it, first 18 verses is the is the prologue and chapter 21 is almost an epilogue for the sake of Peter who fell away and had to be restored. So that's something common with ancient writings but peculiar to John's Gospel in our, in, in our Bible which has the prologue. And you remember in verse 1 it, it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And that's kept the church busy, the theologians of the church busy for about 300 years trying to just understand what that was, and that, that Greek word is logos. So the Apostle John began his gospel with that prologue where he used language that would be easily understood by both the Greeks and the Jews with this word logos. So he uses the word logos, which is translated as word in our English Bibles. And by doing this, in some sense, some, in some sense he congratulates his Greek readers because they at least recognise that the word did not, the world did not come to existence by random chance. The Greeks, like us, they recognised that the world had various complex systems in, in, in place. They saw the complexities within themselves as, as, as human beings. You know, we understand we need, breathe, we need to breathe air, and we know that, that air is transferred to our bloodstreams, it goes around our bodies, our temperatures are regulated, regulated 
uh, you know, we can speak, we can make sounds with our voice, and we have these devices, we have a transmitter, and we have a receiver. So, you know, which came first, the transmitter or the receiver? Well, you know, it has got to be a design. There's a, there's, there's, there's a creator there. We're able to regulate our temperatures, whether we're at minus 5 or at plus 40, as, as we were very recently. The body still copes with that. So they recognize these complex systems. And um, they, so they saw the complexities within themselves as human beings, and they observed a finely tuned system around them in, in, in nature. This ball of fire in the sky, it, it gives light and more fire daily. And the moon, it gives us just enough light at night so that we're not plunged into darkness. And yet, not so much light that it prevents us from sleeping. No, no the heat's doing that at the moment, but it's not the light that's stopping us sleeping. They saw the vegetation as if by magic it sprouts from the earth and, and that this growth was linked to the rain falling from the sky. They also recognised that they were totally dependent on the, on the air in the atmosphere and so that they couldn't see in the air, but they could feel its effect, they could feel the breeze, and they could see how useful it was to propel their ships. Now, philosophers, ancient philosophers, they postulated that various ideas, they postulated their various ideas in an attempt to understand how these essential elements of earth, wind, fire, um, and water, they worked as a cohesive system. And furthermore, how they came into being in the first place. So, so what we recognise, but which, which one is the essential element? Well, it's what we call the quintessential element, the fifth element. They recognise the four, but what's behind it? That's where we get our English word, you know, the quintessence. And they want you to know what the ultimate cause was behind it all. And they use the word logos to describe this, this fifth element, this quintessence. They called it logos. Now the Greeks were using that term for this impersonal, unknown quantity that they were seeking to understand. Now similarly, the Jews also identified this word as being the power of God, or the wisdom of God, and that's seen throughout the Old Testament, that God spoke things in, into existence, and it was his word of wisdom. So John takes all of this into account and says, the word, or the logos, the cause of creation, is not a power or a force, but it's a person who has no beginning and no end. He has always existed. So that's what they couldn't understand. How can something always exist? But recognising that something must necessarily have always existed. For example, if I said to you, well, this came into being, and you said, well, you can ask the question, well, well, who made God? Well, I could imagine I could answer you that. What would your next question be? Well, who made that or him? Then it would be an infinite regress, because you you would always be asking, no, what's the cause of that, the cause of that, the cause of that. So it's necessary that there is this being who's always, who's eternal and self-existent, non-contingent, not, not derived, not dependent on anything. So this is a logos that John is, is speaking about here in, in his prologue. So John began his prologue by dealing with the assumptions held by the culture at that time, and this is something that we must do as well with our culture. He first looked for points of agreement, but then he challenged their thinking. He effectively uses the yes but no argument. To the Greeks, he says, yes, you are correct in recognizing that there is an order in the world that we live in, and in that there must be some intelligent mind or reason behind it all. They were looking for it. They were looking for this fifth element. But no, it's not an impersonal force. It's an intelligent being called, uh, intelligent and eternal being called Jesus. And to the Jew, he says, yes, the world was made by the power of the word, and by his eternal wisdom, all things, all things made are sustained. But no, the power of God and the wisdom of God is not merely one of his attributes. It's a person sent by God called Jesus, in 1 Corinthians 1 to 24, if you, want, if you want a reference for that. Now, we might try doing the same uh, by agreeing with our culture that, yes, the world is indeed a finely tuned system, and therefore scientists tell us that we must be careful how much CO2 we use. Uh, how much CO2, how much CO2, CO2 we, we produce. But then we must disagree with that culture's assumptions and say the finely tuned system that we have didn't come into being by accident. It is finely tuned, yes, but it didn't come, come about by, by chance. There is a design behind it all. And just as John corrected his, his Jewish reader's understanding of, of the word or logos uh, being, uh, being limited, uh, to the power and wisdom of God, we might do the same with our fellow believers. You know, I, yeah, that's what I said, with fellow believers. 
instead of just filtering the Bible and seeing the portions where God loves us and wants to bless us, we must also read the portions where God says that he is holy and that he will do everything in his power to make us holy. You see, it's so significant if you were the only person on the planet, he still would have had to send his son. It would have been necessary to send his son. And that might mean that we will suffer. If it's going to make us holy, it may mean that we suffer. We may suffer lots, we may suffer illness, we may, we may suffer many things. And we suffer instead of receiving some temporary blessing in the form of health or wealth. Instead of rejecting God, because it doesn't conform to our thinking of what God should be like and, and how and how he should and how he should act, we should perhaps look at God at what he has done by humiliating himself to be born as a baby and allowing himself to be mocked and to be tortured and be killed by the ones who had been who who he had had to have created. See, that's in the prologue too. All things came into existence by him. And he came to his own, but his own rejected him. Not just the Jews, and that's that that's sort of into what, what John has in mind, but all the ones that he created. So uh, all humankind that had been created by God, they rejected him. In other words, we must bring our attention back, uh, back to Christ, the Word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's John 1. 14. So that's the laws, that's the word. That's what John's doing. He's saying, no, forget about the elements, forget about this, forget about that. The logos is a person. He's pointing them to Christ. So whatever debates, philosophical debates, or whatever you get into with Greek people, you always come back to Christ. Who was Christ? You know, or, you know, do worry his claims true. You know, forget about the evolution argument, the suffering argument. Yeah, they're they're real and there's a fine place to do with them. But very often it's a smoke screen. And you know it's because they don't want to consider Christ, and we must always do do what the what the uh, what do what the evangelists do, what the, what the apostles do. They keep coming back to Christ, and that's what John does in his gospel. But before the apostle goes on to tell us more about the Logos and, and how he was sent by God, he, he introduces another person who was also sent by God. Now the apostle John introduces another man by the same name who was sent as a witness to testify that Jesus has indeed been sent by God as a saviour for the world. Now having introduced this, this other John, who we know as John the Baptist, the Apostle, he continued in, in the prologue to describe the Logos and how he made everything that has ever been made, including the, pe including the people that John was writing to. He was in the world and the world was made through him and yet shockingly the world rejected him. But to all who did receive him, they were privileged with the right to be called children of God. So John concludes his prologue by saying, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Effectively saying what Jesus said, if you have seen me, speaking to Philip, he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is the face of God. Now, if we study the prologue and went no further, that is, if we study these first 18 verses and went no further, it would be extremely valuable and beneficial for us, and I would encourage you to go over these verses several times. However, the problem with not reading any further than verse 18 is that we would be puzzled uh, to the identity of this other John, who John the Apostle mentions earlier on, but then goes back to the Logos. We think, okay, that's written. why did he mention that? we were probably thinking, well, who is he and why is he mentioned there? And it, in, in a similar way, perhaps, we would ask the same question if we read Genesis chapter 14 and didn't read the rest of the Bible. Now, I'll save you the hassle, the uh, worry, the concern. This is the chapter where Melchizedek is introduced. So if you read about Melchizedek in Genesis 14, you would ask the same question. Well, well who is this guy? Why is he even mentioned? And all we are told is that he is a man who meets, meets Abraham and he receives tithes from him. Now, we would never have discovered the identity of Melchizedek as being the pre-incarnate Christ if it weren't for the explanations given to us in the New Testament book of Hebrews. We've got to continue reading. And this is what John's expecting. The Apostle John, therefore, only briefly mentions this other John with the full expectation that his readers will shortly discover who he is. In the prologue, John's main aim is to set forth the identity of Jesus, the Word, the Logos. But in his next few verses, the verses that were kindly read for us, we're, we're about to we're, we're about to we're about to look at now. He gives us a summary of the ministry and the testimony of John the Baptist. Now, although we tend to not to pay too much attention to John the Baptist, 
This, this was not always the case. In the first century, he attracted a huge amount of attention among the Jewish people of his time. Um, and secular historians of the first century amazingly gave more information about John the Baptist than they did about Jesus. And isn't that remarkable? They've spoken more about John the Baptist as his figure that's appearing in the wilderness. They wrote about him. So what was the reason for this? Uh, well, we know that Israel had a rich history of many prophets being sent to them by God. But Israel's prophetic witness, it, it had ceased with the last of the Old Testament prophets, and that is Malachi. And since Malachi, there's been a period of about 400 years of silence, complete silence. There had been no word from God for 400 years, but then suddenly a new prophet appeared on the scene. This bizarre character was bizarre. He lived, he lived, who lived in the desert, and which desert was the, the traditional meeting place between God and his prophets, if you think of Elijah. He, and he was dressed in clothing made from camels there, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. I mean, yeah, pretty weird. Um, and in a very, very short time, John the Baptist's activity, it attracted widespread attention. Because there was no word from God for 400 years. And then all of a sudden, there's a prophet who looked like Elijah and sounded like Elijah. Now, John the Baptist's message was simple. Repent. Metanoia. Turn away from your, from, your, from your sins. He cried, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he said, there's an urgency. You must repent. There is urgency here. That's Matthew 3, verse 2. He was warning Israel that the coming of the Messiah was no longer a distant event in an unknown future, but that it was imminent. Furthermore, his coming would be for the purpose of judgment. He said his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's reminiscent of Psalm 1. But the but the two people, but not so not so not so the chaff that the righteous will stand before God, but the chaff will be driven away. Unless it's in Luke three seventeen. So John wanted his people to be ready. That's what he was doing. So you've got to be ready. He was preparing the way. Therefore, he called them to repent of their sins and to submit to a cleansing ritual called baptism. Now we know what baptism is, but in the first century, now what's this? Did we read the baptism in the Old Testament? I don't think so. I don't think it's mentioned. And it's important to know that during the intertestamental period, that is between Malachi and uh, John appearing on the scene, that 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there had arisen among the Jews this, ris this ritual of proselyte baptism. Now, proselytes are non-Jews who convert, convert to Judaism. So that's what a proselyte is. So this baptism was therefore limited to Gentiles, and was never administered to Jews. It was proselyte baptism, those who were non-Jews converting to Judaism, effectively becoming, becoming Jews. Now Gentiles were considered unclean, and therefore they had to go through this purification line. And you know, even you know, it, it was it was accepted. They were called dogs. I mean Psalm 22, dogs that surrounded me. Um, Jesus himself to the Syrophoenician woman says it's not right to take the children's food and to give it to the little dogs. And it wasn't necessarily a derogatory term, it was accepted. Yeah, the Gentiles are dogs, they're unclean. Jews are clean, Gentiles are unclean. So the purification rite was for the Gentiles. They had to go through this, they had to take the bath, as it were, before they could be welcomed into the covenant community of Israel. But John the Baptist, he directed his call for repentance not to Gentiles, but to Jews, to his own people. He was saying to Israel, the Lord. The, sorry, the Lord's long-awaited Messiah is coming, but you're not ready for it. You are unclean. He therefore called Israel to submit to this ritual cleansing to up until that point had been administered only to Gentiles. Now, with proselyte baptism, the typical procedure was for the convert to baptise himself. Now, we're used to seeing, you know, you have elders or whatever in the church baptise you know, new converts. But here, they were expected to baptise themselves. No, we're not coming here. We're not going to touch you. You're unclean. You baptise yourself. And when you're done, you, you, know, you come back. He was, he was not baptised by the Levites or by the priests who, who would normally perform all the other purification rites in Israel. They were responsible for that, the priests and the Levites. 
But in this instance, it was John who was doing the baptism, even though he had no official status to perform any kind of ritual cleansing. He was not a priest, even though his father was a priest. If you remember, Zechariah, when he was given the announcement, went to the temple, struck down, given a tablet at the end, you know, name shall be John, etc. Do you remember that? You'll be reminded of Christmas, I'm, I'm sure, so just be patient. And, and so these, these irregularities of, of this John baptizing, you know, this, you know, this unqualified, scruffy person in, in, in the desert eating you know, insects and eating, eating honey, all, all everything he was doing, it came to the end, the attention of the religious authorities in Jerusalem. And you can imagine him saying, you know, who does he think he is? To call us, the children of Abraham, to undergo ritual cleansing. No, no, no. He's got that wrong. That's what Gentiles do. We are the children of Abraham. The Pharisees wanted to know what was going on there by the River, river, river Jordan. So they sent this delegation to investigate. Now find out what's going on, so, you know, see what it's all about, and report back to us. So wasting no time at all, they, they asked, well, who are you, John 1.19? And John replied, I am not the Christ. And you, you scratch your head thinking, well, they didn't ask if you were the Christ. It wasn't a direct, it wasn't a closed question, it was an open question, you know, who are you? But he must have known what they were thinking. Is this the Messiah? So he preempts that and says, I am not the Christ. Now the structure of the sentence is, 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 is awkward, but it's the strongest method in the Greek to show that Jesus, no, sorry, that John was emphatic in saying that I am not the Christ, and there's no doubt. So having, having heard John emphatically deny that, he, uh, deny that he was the Christ, they continued with their questions. They were saying, well, if you're not the Messiah, by the way, if Christ and Messiah is the same thing, Messiah, Christ is, is the Greek, uh, and the Christos is equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah, which is, which, which, which is, is Messiah. So if you always wondered, Messiah is the Hebrew, uh, Christos is the Greek, and we get our word Christ, and it means anointed one. He says, well, if you're not the Messiah, then who are you? And they began to go for all the various possibilities of who he might be. Beginning with the Old Testament prophet called Elijah. They said, what then? Are you Elijah? So to which John replied, I am not. Now, Elijah had been dead for hundreds of years. So why don't you suppose they would ask such a strange question? As I've already mentioned, the last canonical prophet was Malachi. The last prophet in the Old Testament was Malachi. And in the last, prophet, and in the last paragraph of his book, the last prophecy of the Old Testament, Malachi recorded these words of God. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Malachi 4 verse 5. So just before this 400 years of divine silence commenced, God promised that the great day of the Lord would come, but not until Elijah came to announce it. Now this is the reason why the Jewish, Jewish leaders uh, when they saw John the Baptist behaving like Elijah, would come to him and ask him, are you Elijah? And John, John's reply once again was unambiguous. He said, I am not. Now that reply, it creates a bit of a problem for us. Because when Jesus spoke about John the Baptist and his disciples, he said, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. So is that a contradiction? Does this create a problem for us? That's Matthew 11, 14. With that cryptic introduction, if you are willing to accept it, Jesus was indicating that John was Elijah in some sense. That is, his ministry was a fulfilment of Malachi's prophecy, even though John the Baptist personally was not Elijah. Now, there's some thoughts that in the book of Revelation, the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Um, so that could, that, could, that could be the fulfilment of that. Now, this is also borne out by what the angel said to Zechariah. You remember me saying that Zechariah, the priest, went into the temple and had the, the vision of the angel? Um, the angel said that he, that is John, will go before him, before the Messiah, in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that's again Luke 1, verse 17. So the angel had also said, had indicated that he would go forth in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So next the priests and the Levites asked, are you the prophet? And once again he answered, no. And you can just imagine their frustration now. Now no, notice that the question wasn't, 
are you a prophet? Rather, it was, are you the prophet? So who did these delegates from Jerusalem have in mind? Well, Deuteronomy, that is the fifth book of the Old Testament, uh, records that God said to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Deuteronomy 18, 18. Now, just for interest, uh, uh, the Muslims believe that this is a prophecy on a prophecy on uh, relating to Muhammad. It, it, it obviously isn't. It, it's people. It's a prophet called from among them, from among the Jews. But just just for interest, and that's Deuteronomy eighteen eighteen, and there's a similar verse, similar word in verse fifteen too. So for, for centuries, <clears throat> the Jews have been waiting, uh, not just for the return of Elijah but also for the return of this special prophet who would be like Moses. Now Moses was unique in that he was not just the prophet, not like the other prophets, but he was also the mediator of the old covenant. Now a covenant, if you're not familiar with that, that term, it's, it's a love re relationship that is legally binding. So if you're struggling to remember this, just think of the marriage ceremony where two people who love each other, they agree to be bound by certain rules and regulations. So that's a way to think about covenant, a lovely way to do it, where, where it's, it, it's bound by rules and regulation. A covenant is more binding than a love relationship, and it's more loving than a contract. So that's the other way to think of it. A covenant is more binding than a love relationship, and, and it is more loving than a mere contract. So a prophet like Moses would be one who would also mediate a covenant. He would be the mediator of the new covenant, that is the Messiah. It was for this reason that the Jewish leaders asked John, are you the prophet? They're thinking, well, you know, this is all we know about. We know about Elijah, we know about the prophet. In other words, are you the one like Moses? But again, John answers no. So you can almost imagine their, their frustration. The priests and the Levites were feeling, feeling at this point. So they said to him, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Verse 22. They had looked for John's identity in the book of Malachi. It wasn't there. They had looked in the book of Deuteronomy. It wasn't there. So John takes them to another book, the book I hadn't mentioned, and that's the book of Isaiah. And John quoted from Isaiah chapter 40. He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. John 1.23 Isaiah declared that before the Messiah would come into the world, he would send his messenger. And John was saying, this is who I am. I am that messenger. I am the one who is building the road and filling the potholes, clearing the debris. I am getting the people's hearts ready for his arrival. So that's what he was saying to them. Now the Jewish leaders, you think they would stop there, but they didn't. Their questions didn't stop. Once they'd established John's identity, they were still troubled with this baptism issue. Because that's what they'd been sent there for in the first place. So they asked him, then why are you baptizing? If you're not the Christ, you're not Elijah, nor the prophet. In other words, they were questioning him regarding his authority. You're not a priest, you're not a Levite, you didn't go to any rabbinical schools, you don't dress like us, you don't talk to us, you don't live in Jerusalem. No, what's the big idea? The rituals are for the Levites and the priests. So what do you do? Where do you get your authority? Is what they were asking. Now does this remind you of anybody else? Well, in Mark chapter 11, we read of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem where he cleansed the temple by driving out the money changers. Not familiar with that? We'll wait till Easter. So you are going to separate the Christmas, the cleansing of the temple at Easter. Or you can read it beforehand if you want. Now, this action did not escape, when Jesus came to the temple, this action did not escape the notice of the Jewish leaders who came to him again and asked, by what authority are you doing these things? Probably thinking, well, you're not a priest, you're not a Levite. You know, they, they could have asked the same questions as, as, as they asked John. By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you the authority to do them? You know, you, you might have the authority, but perhaps someone else told you to do it. Well, who told you? And that's Mark 11, verse 28. Now, do you remember how Jesus responded? Jesus said to him, Well, I ask you a question, and you answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. 
Was the Baptist baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. It's as if it's almost as if Jesus was saying, Do you remember the last person you questioned regarding his authority for doing what he did? And do you remember how he answered? He said, I, I baptize you with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me. The strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. So these Jewish leaders may have been thinking about John's response, and now they may be wondering, wondering if this is indeed the one whom John spoke of, the one whose strap sandal he was unfit to, uh, he was not fit to untie. So notice that when John was questioned about his authority, he answered by referring to Christ, the one who had commissioned John in the first place. And when Christ was questioned about his authority, he answered by referring to John, the one who had borne witness to his identity. So they were referencing each other and said, well, did John spoke about me. John said, well, Jesus is coming. You know, he's, he's coming up and I'm not fit to untie his sandal strap. You know, I love Jesus' answer. And um, I remember when I was at school, as uh, a long time ago, it's over 40 years ago, that um, I, remember, I remember doing RE. I wasn't a Christian at the time, doing RE, going through Mark's Gospel. And I've not, not, heard any of this, not heard any of these stories, but I remember this cleansing of the temple and Jesus' question about his authority. And I was so impressed. Um, that's like not a believer. By thinking, wow, you know, he answered that question. Then Jesus was answered a question about paying taxes. He said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar, and to, and to God that which is God. And you know, I was impressed, so I wanted to read more. And, uh, you know, I did read John's, uh, Mark's Gospel because I had, to, I had to pass the exam. But um, you know, that was my introduction before being a, a believer. So it's all about Christ. So John answered, coming back to this now, John answered indirectly to say that he was not worthy to be doing what he was doing. He said, yeah, I'm baptising, but one's coming. And you know what? You think I've got authority, but I've got no authority. I'm not even, I'm not even fit to undo the sandal thong of, of the one who is, who is to come. And this should be the response of all Christians. No matter what you do, I wish you we went all after titles and prestige and power. We're unfit to undo the thong of our master's sandal. Now, now, R.C. Sproul, he picks up on a little detail that I think most of us would miss. John mentioned, John's mention of uh, Jesus' sandal strap was, was a Jewish idiom. They, it was a saying of that time, an expression used by the Jews. Disciples of Jewish rabbis, such as Jesus, who was a rabbi and a master, a teacher, um, so disciples of Jewish rabbis, such as Jesus' Jesus' disciples, not only sat at his feet listening to his lectures, but they also took on the role of personal slaves or servants. A disciple would learn all he could from his teacher as part of the deal, as well as to demonstrate their love and respect, that they would take care of all their rabbi's needs. A, a disciple would, would make his housing arrangements, he would get his food and so on, get his lunch. And we see examples of this in Jesus' ministry when his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food when he sat near Jacob's well in Samaria. They went off to buy lunch and Jesus was left alone at the well. And you know the story of the woman of the, woman of the well in John 4. And on another occasion, Jesus sent his disciples to Jerusalem to make sure that the room was reserved for the Passover meal. See, that's what they were, they were responsible for. That was part of the deal. However, one thing that differentiated a disciple in a rabbinical, rabbinical school from a slave was that the disciple was never, never required to take care of the teacher's shoes or sandals. Only a slave could be reduced to this humiliating task. Therefore, when John said, I'm not even worthy to unstrap these sandals, he was, he was saying, look, don't look at me, I'm lower than a disciple. I'm even lower than a slave. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes, to take up his sandals and to clean his feet. Don't look to me, look to him. See, once you know this, your reading of John 13 changes, and John 13 it is where Jesus washed his disciples' feet. They think, well, we're not going to wash each other's feet. No, you know, we're disciples. That's not, no, but read, you know, read the contract. What does it say? Where, where does it say washing feet? There, there isn't that. That's for slave. But Jesus, knowing where he was from, knowing where he was going, go to the top of the tower and wash his disciples' feet. He said he was secure. Knowing that he was from the Father, he was going back to the Father. 
so secure. And that's our position too. And we can be humble because we know that we're sons of the King. We're adopted children of the Creator of the universe. If it's true of you, then you're a Christian. If it's not true of you, then that's not the case. So John had just confidently asserted that he was indeed the one whom Isaiah spoke of. He said, yeah, that's me. Isaiah chapter 40, well, it didn't have chapters there. But Isaiah chapter 40, yeah, he's speaking about me. And no, he could have been quite proud of that. Now imagine if that were you or if that were me. Imagine that one of the greatest Old Testament prophets had said that you would come and prepare a way for the saviour of the world. You would be the one who would have the responsibility to announce to the world that God would become a man. The Logos would become a man. Yeah, the word became flesh and dwelt in man. That's your job. And Isaiah prophesied about 700 BC. John, 700 years later, John, yeah, by the way, that's you. You, you, you better read up, you know, just so you're familiar with that passage. You would, you would be the one so that God would come and visit his people. Now, how would that make you feel? That out of the millions of people who would, who would live over a period of that 700 years, you were the one to be chosen to declare to your nation that the Messiah is coming and that they needed to get ready. As for me, I think I'd be overwhelmed with, well, with mixed emotions. I think I would feel a sense of privilege and pride. Wow, you know, I've been chosen for that. But at the same time, I would struggle with the immense responsibility. Wow, well, I've got to do that. But that's a huge task. That can't be left with me. I'm not that responsible. I forget things. You know, you know what's it I'm supposed to be doing? Now, perhaps this is how John the Baptist felt. Perhaps he felt all these emotions and was struggling to deal with them. And maybe the only way he could get the attention from himself was to say, no, it's, it's, not, it's not about me. You know, please don't focus on me. It's not about me. Don't look to me. I'm only a messenger. I know I mentioned, but it's only a messenger. That's that's natural. I'm not even worthy to be called a slave, let alone a disciple. Now those of us who believe in and are trusting Christ are also his disciples. And like John, we are not worthy to untie his shoes, for we have sinned against God and despised his just rule. You think, no, that's not true. Every time you sin, you're saying, that, well, I know this is what you've commanded. I know I call you Lord. But at this moment in time, that sin is more, I take more delight in that sin than I do in you. So, yeah, that is us. We do despise God's law. Every time we sin, we choose to sin. Despite that, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from our sins. And that's why we stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And we see how marvelous, how wonderful, you know, that he died for me. So may we never cease to give thanks for such a great salvation. And like John, we have a responsibility to witness and in a sense to make straight his path. You know, to clear away the confusion that people have about Christ. Well, Christ is the only one? Yes. Now there must be other ways to know. We too will have we too have have our authority questioned for saying the things that we say. Uh, think, well, you can't say the Bible is the only way. You can't say, you know, there's only male and female and, and all the other things that are going on in the world around us now. And like, and like John, we have been chosen and sent by God to boldly proclaim that the power behind everything we see around us is not some random, impersonal chance. It's a person. He is a person. And the authority for doing and saying the things that we do, it comes from his word. Yeah, we should stand firm on his word. Have confidence in his word. Read his word. The Bible, it, it has nothing to do with my opinions. It's got nothing to do with your opinions. But it has everything to do with the one who created us and has authority over us. The Logos, the word who was in the beginning with God and was God. The word who became flesh and dwelt among us. <laughs>
thank you for our time of fellowship, our time of celebrating the communion together and the communion we have with each other. Thank you for your word. We thank you for that uh, promise, that song we just sang in, in that, that intra-trinitarian prayer. We thank you, oh my Father, for sending us your Son and leaving your Spirit until the work is done. We're reminded that there's a work to do. We're to proclaim the message, we're to make the path straight, we're to be mini John the Baptist, so to speak, and speak about the one who's sandal strap when we're not fit and we're not fit to untie. So will you help us? Will you embolden us? Will you strengthen us? Keep us close to you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who who, who indwells us. We thank you that you hold on to us and it's not us, not we who hold on to you. In Jesus' name we ask, Amen.